As you know from CBE 330 and some of your other undergraduate coursework, chemical and biological processes have complex dynamics that are often described by large systems of coupled, nonlinear, ordinary differential equations, and differential algebraic equations. And it doesn't matter whether we're describing a chemical process with unit operations and pipelines and pumps like the one you see here, or whether we're describing processes that occur inside of biological systems, from organelles to cells to organs and tissues, the same sorts of mathematical equations can be used to describe them. So in this class, we're going to spend quite a bit of time developing some mathematical tools that we can use to understand how coupled systems of differential equations and differential algebraic equations behave. This will enable us to understand process dynamics at a deeper level so that we can control the dynamics of chemical and biological processes. Understanding how the process dynamics behave and how the control systems behave is essential for engineers so that we can design and maintain systems at desired operating conditions. In order to select those desired operating conditions and the control schemes that we will use, we'll consider product specifications. Sometimes we want to design control systems so that a product stream has the correct composition, for example, or so that a waste stream doesn't violate some environmental regulation. We also need to consider process safety. The basic process control system is integrated with other systems that are in place to ensure process safety. Process control can be used to improve the efficiency of processes as well. By maintaining processes near their steady state design conditions, we can avoid inefficiencies like waste energy and other utility streams. And of course, controlling production processes can help ensure that we maintain compliance with local, state, and federal environmental regulations. Up to this point in your chemical and biological engineering curriculum, you've done quite a bit of process design. You've designed chemical reactors, you've designed pumps, you've designed separation operations, you've designed heat exchange equipment, and for the most part, you've largely considered the design for steady state operation. However, continuous processes rarely actually operate at steady state, and if they do, it's only because disturbances and other changes to the process can be well managed, and that's what the process control system does. But in this class, we will consider both steady state and unsteady operation. Before we go much further, I want to introduce to you three process control laws which come from a different textbook than the one that we're using in this class. These are from Leuven and Leuven's Essentials of Process Control. And these are key concepts that we'll return to throughout the semester. The first is that the best process control system is the simplest one that will do the job. This is an application of Occam's razor. We can design very complex control systems, but complex control systems may not be necessary to achieve the desired function. And they may, in fact, introduce unnecessary reliability issues, for example. Leuben and Leuben's second process control law is that you must understand the process before you can control it. In fact, we're going to spend several weeks in this class just discussing process dynamics before we start talking in detail about the design of controllers. By taking a deep dive into process dynamics, we will be able to understand processes and we'll introduce some language that we can use to discuss them before we attempt to design control systems. The third rule from Leuben and Leuben is that liquid levels must always be controlled. There are some rare exceptions to this, such as, such as the level in surge drums on recycle lines. But for the most part, liquid levels should always be controlled. We've used the term process already. In this class, we'll use the term process to refer to the conversion of some feed stream to some products using chemical, biological, or other physical operations. The process can refer to both the operation, that is the changes that are occurring in the system, as well as the equipment used to affect that change or the unit operations. A continuous process, as you know, is one in which material moves continuously from one unit operation to the next. And in continuous processes, all of the operations occur simultaneously. Batch processes, on the other hand, are those for which operations are performed in a sequence in an allotment of feed. Now, we won't talk much about process control for batch processes, but there's a chapter in our textbook that I don't intend to cover this semester that does describe 
some interesting applications of batch process control. And this is an important area if you become a process control engineer. In batch processes, each operation is performed one at a time. We're going to use some common language to describe particular types of process variables. The first type is called a controlled variable. A controlled variable should have a set point, that is, a desired value of that controlled variable that's the target for the process control system to maintain the controlled variable at. A manipulated variable, on the other hand, is a process variable that is changed to maintain controlled variables at their respective set points. The vast majority of manipulated variables are flow rates. They can be feed flow rates, they can be effluent flow rates, and often they're utility stream flow rates, such as heating steam or cooling water. A disturbance variable is any process variable that influences a controlled variable, but is not a manipulated variable. When describing process control schemes, it's important for us to be able to identify the controlled, manipulated, and disturbance variables. While in a particular unit operation, a disturbance variable cannot by definition be, cannot by definition also be a manipulated variable. However, the manipulated variable for one control loop may actually be a disturbance variable for a different control loop, as we'll see later when we discuss multivariate control. There are cases, including one in the textbook, in which a controlled variable is also a manipulated variable. In the next video, we'll use these definitions and we'll introduce an example of a blending tank operation to illustrate some key concepts of process control.